Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Susan Hatters Friedman. Hey, Susan, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. Uh, To give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background on you, Susan Hatters Friedman is a psychiatrist specializing in psychiatry and maternal mental health. She currently serves as the president of the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. Susan received the Manfred Guttmacher Award from the American Psychiatric Association for editing the book, Family Murder, Pathologies of Love and Hate. She's pursuing a master's in crime fiction, which is super cool, at the University of Cambridge and has studied with the Second City, the world's premier comedy club, comedy theater, and school of improvisation. And her creative writing is found in Hobart, Eclectica, and Drunk Monkeys, among others. And we are going to be talking about mistakes writers make about forensic psychiatry and how to avoid them. And this is going to join a lineup of other mistakes writers make in the crime fiction area. Uh, Just to give a quick run through of those, it's PIs with Patrick Hoffman, the FBI with Jerry Williams, first responders with Ken Fritz, coroners with Jennifer Grazer Dornbush, police procedure with Bruce Robert Coffin, and firearms with Chris Grawl. And you can find all those if you go to theindieauthor.com forward slash podcast and search for mistakes. So we wanted to dive into the mistakes writers make about forensic psychiatry, but before we do that, I had to ask about your experience with Second City. Talk about that a little bit. So it's very exciting. During the pandemic in particular, people from around the country, around the world have been able to study online with the Second City. And with my interest, I studied satire writing and they have a a course of different series that you take to study satire writing with them and fabulous experience um, learning from amazing satire writers. And you were saying this was an online uh, opportunity, which is pretty nice opening that up to more people. Amazing. And yes, um, not needing to think about how to get to class during the pandemic and and super interesting people from all around the country and the world. That's great. Actually, I was debating about whether to ask you about the Second City experience or getting a master's of crime fiction at the University of Cambridge, but it sounds like there might actually be some overlap if you're studying satire, for example, in the Second City. Is there overlap? Are you being able to apply the learnings from one to the other? Oh, I definitely think so, because with crime fiction writing, thinking about how to lay the clues and, and, and where is the appropriate place for, for different things and similar to, to how you're needing to think about how to lay things out in satire. For, yes. Very cool. I have to say that as a unique CV that I got for a guest. So that was very fun to read. So I thought what I would do, the article that I will include a link to in the show notes for this episode has a list of, I believe, 10 mistakes that writers commonly make in this area. And uh, we'll see how many we can get through. I'll feed you some of the comments, and I would love to hear your thoughts and uh, examples, pro and con in crime fiction. And the first one, which I think is sort of foundational, is forensic psychiatry is not forensic psychology. So talk about that a little bit. Yes, absolutely. And I think before I went to medical school, I I might have been unclear about the exact difference as well. So I know that a a lot of people confuse psychiatry and psychology, much less uh, forensic psychiatry and psychology. Psychiatry is a branch of of medical science. So a psychiatrist like me has gone to, in America, undergrad for four years and then medical school for four years and then done psychiatric training, an internship, a residency, which is four years more if you're subspecializing in something else, and then a fellowship in forensic psychiatry, which is a year in the U.S. And so during that time, we're in medical school, learning to be psychiatrists in in medical school, we're taking the same courses and doing the same practical experiences in the hospital as someone going into internal medicine, as someone going into surgery. And then the the residency, you're working as a resident doctor in in the hospital, except you're focused on psychiatry, a bit of neurology, a bit of internal medicine um, and family medicine. So we have that background as well. I would think of our training as more similar to uh, what you would see in that Gray's Anatomy as far as the, the residency and learning from the, the attending physicians prior to, to becoming an attending physician oneself. And there's very um, structured length of time that things take. So it's a four-year residency longer if you're doing child psychiatry or adding on geriatric psychiatry or addiction psychiatry. And then a forensic psychiatry fellowship is, is one year after the residency as well. And so it is a bunch of time that it takes to do it. An example that I like to give of what is psychiatry versus psychology, the 
background I have, Fraser Crane's apartment, Fraser Crane and his brother Niles Crane were um, psychiatrists in fiction and television, and they were medical doctors who became psychiatrists. So psychologists, instead of an MD, they have a PhD. So they've pursued undergraduate and then graduate school in psychology. And then they do additional training in the hospital as well, but they're not medical doctors. So a lot of the things that we do may be very similar, but we diverge in in some areas. So in in general, psychiatrists are able to prescribe medication because of of going to medical school, et cetera. Psychologists are able to do therapy as our psychiatrists. Uh, Psychologists also have a a wealth of of different experience, but it's a different role. And in a lot of things you read or a lot of things you watch on TV, it may flip-flop from one scene to the next if someone's a psychiatrist or psychologist or forensic psychiatrist or psychologist. And in, in real life, they're different roles with different background and training. Is there something that is the red flag for you that someone's gotten it wrong if they're presenting the character as one of those and then they do something? What's something that they do that is just not accurate? The switching back and forth is something I see a lot, but also medication. So in general, forensic psychiatry units will have a team-based approach. And so there's a forensic psychiatrist, a forensic psychologist on the hospital unit, nurses, social work, occupational therapy, rehabilitation, et cetera. And it will be the forensic psychiatrist who's prescribing the medication and testifying about medication, prescribing medication. Those are in general, the province of the forensic psychiatrist. So the, that difference between psychiatry and psychology is important, but I think that the other key word here is forensic. And I realized embarrassingly recently that I think I'd always assumed that forensic had to do with death, but then you hear about like forensic accounting and things like that. So can you explain what the term forensic actually means? Sure. The forensic and forensic psychiatry is really anywhere where psychiatry interacts, intersects with the legal system. So in in crime fiction, it's a lot of thinking about evaluations of defendants or of uh, perpetrators. And our role as forensic psychiatrists is, is there in the legal system in that way in a lot of crime fiction. But it can be anywhere where um, we intersect with the legal system for forensic psychiatrists. Civil law cases, for example, a disability evaluation, a malpractice evaluation, those would be included as well. Also included within forensic psychiatry would be correctional psychiatry. So psychiatrists working um, with offenders or with defendants in the correctional system would fall under forensic psychiatry. And then also we may help educate legislators about psychiatric issues, and that would fall under the umbrella of forensic psychiatry as well. Okay, thank you. One of the other key points you highlighted where people get things wrong was the topic of confidentiality. Confidentiality with a treating psychiatrist is similar to that with a priest or lawyer. Can you talk about that a little bit and where you see people getting that right or wrong in crime fiction? Absolutely. I think that it's really important that readers and and folks in the general population understand the role of um, psychiatrists as far as confidentiality, because I don't want it to dissuade anyone from getting the help they need, the mental health help they need, and feeling like we're just going to go tell somebody about what they said. And so, yes, it's, it's similar to like a priest and someone who's coming to the priest or other sorts of doctors that, that we need to keep things confidential. There are certain uh, exceptions that are very specific within the law, like uh, if there's ongoing child abuse that we're concerned about, for example, or an acute threat that we need to hospitalize uh, someone, for example. Um, but there are various instances in crime fiction where, for example, a psychiatrist sees a patient, the patient reports something to them, the psychiatrist gets suspicious and then reports it to the police. And, and that's not something we, we can just do. If I was seeing someone, for example, and they were making homicidal threats, usually the first thing we're thinking of is hospitalizing them for safety. There are very specific instances where, where law enforcement would, would be notified, but that's in a couple of cases in, in, in crime fiction, it's just the patient reports something to the, the psychiatrist or the therapist, and right away the police find out. In otherwise wonderful novels that I really enjoy reading, but it, it takes me out of the story for one, but it also makes me worried, is someone who's thinking about seeing a psychiatrist for this personal issue that they're having going to be um, afraid that if, if, if they do, other people are going to find out? So yeah, there are very specific exceptions to to confidentiality, but in general, it's between the adult patient and the psychiatrist. 
I think in that case, a writer has two choices. One is that they have a character that's a psychiatrist and that they decide to be <laughs> realistic about it and they don't have the character do that. But I can imagine a plot where the plot requires that that someone who has perpetrated a crime confides in someone else or someone who's thinking about uh, committing a crime confides in someone else and that person goes to the authorities. Is there an alternative to making that person a psychiatrist that you can think of that would legitimately result in that the person that's being confided in being able to go to the police? That's an interesting question. Legitimately versus crime fiction, because in crime fiction, I can certainly imagine someone making an anonymous call or something like that that would not be ethical in, in, in real life, or someone over hearing someone talking to, to someone who they're telling confidentially um, in, in crime fiction might, might be something. I like or, that because you've identified a third option, which is the person does the bad thing, but there's some acknowledgement that it's a bad, unethical, out of norm thing to do, which may take your story in a different direction. Or, or someone finds something that someone wrote about or their text messages or et cetera, someone, yeah. So I, I can imagine other ways. It worries me when it's a treating psychiatrist going to the police about their patient. And you had mentioned hospitalization. So can you talk a little bit about what that process is like? And it sounds like the police don't necessarily, maybe they necessarily do not get involved in that kind of step if someone has said something that the psychiatrist believes should be met with hospitalization. Sure. And here I'm, I'm talking about like someone seeing their, their general psychiatrist in the community and the psychiatrist having concerns primarily is the person because of their mental illness presenting a risk to others or to themselves that really hospitalization is, is the appropriate option. Then either the psychiatrist would talk to them about voluntarily coming to the hospital or in some cases the, the psychiatrist would, would need to um, move toward an involuntary hospitalization if there was serious concern about the risk and the person didn't have insight in, into the importance of getting treatment. And so every state has different rules about exactly how that works, but no, in many cases, the police wouldn't uh, need to be involved in that if the person came to the emergency room or if EMS was involved, et cetera, psychiatrists, and depending on the state, which um, one could check with the state laws of, of the state that someone's in or, or talk with a psychiatrist about how it works. There are processes and procedures for how the person would be psychiatrically hospitalized. And uh, there are very specific uh, procedures to protect the person's rights, but it's also thinking about the um, state's power to want to protect the rest of its citizens as, as well as that person themselves if it was a concern about suicide, et cetera. We know in the past, psychiatric hospitalization 50 years ago, 100 years ago, has a, a history of, of being misused. And that's why there are very specific safeguards and rules of what the psychiatrist, what the hospital needs to do and the evidence that needs to be provided uh, to a judge in a specific time frame, depending on, on the state, about the person's uh, risk and, and dangerousness from mental illness. And what would the process actually look like? I know that there would be a ton of variability from case to case, but just picking out uh, an example, if the psychiatrist felt that hospitalization was necessary and the person they were working with wasn't willing to do it voluntarily, how does the involuntary hospitalization process work? Sure. So depending on the state, for example, in Ohio, where I currently work, there's a form called a, a pink slip. It's called uh, different things in different states based on how it came about and the different state laws. And so, for example, Ohio, there are uh, criteria that, this, that the psychiatrist would need to consider. Does the person have a mental illness? Is it impacting their judgment, their ability to recognize reality, um, et cetera? And then is it causing them uh, to be at an acute risk of harm? themselves or others or unable to take care of themselves. And so then that is completed. The person is hospitalized. And in Ohio, we have to file more paperwork with, with the court within a 72-hour time frame. So you can see it's a, a very short hold. And then the, the court becomes involved and civil commitment proceedings may occur. The, the goal is to, to get people the, the help they need in the uh, shortest amount of time, though, as well. So 
someone may even be released before the, the court becomes involved, depending on how they're doing, are the medications working, et cetera. And is there any difference between a person working with a psychiatrist and saying that they committed a crime in the past versus that they're thinking about committing a crime in the future? Yes. <laughs> Great question. And yes, I would say most psychiatrists I know would um, be contacting their, their hospital's legal department if, if either things happen just to, to, to make sure the current state of the law and that. But yes, in general, as I was saying, like with the priest as well, a, a past crime is different than a future crime that someone's planning to commit, et cetera, and that's, that's related to their mental illness. Now, a, a, an exception to that would be child abuse, elder abuse, if someone's in danger right at the present time because of ongoing criminal activity. But, but yeah, I think most psychiatrists would be checking with their legal office of their hospital if, if any of those things happen. But yes, thinking similar to, to the priest. And this is a little bit of a tangential one, but that answer made me think, would there be a scenario where a psychiatrist is not affiliated with a hospital, they're an independent practitioner, and in that case, would they go to their, law their lawyer to ask? A lawyer that? or every psychiatrist in America is going to have a malpractice insurer, and they have a law team and different malpractice insurers to help through legal situations like that or concerning situations like that. I'm going to move on to another one that sort of caught my uh, fancy, which was forensic psychiatrists are not lie detectors. <laughs> Talk yes. about that a little bit. Well, so many things you hear colloquially or when people strike up a conversation with me at a party or something, and they'll ask like, how can you tell if someone's lying? And uh, yeah, they're kind of old wives tales or myths that you hear about if someone looks in a certain direction, um, et cetera, it, it means they're lying. If only it were that easy. Um, when we are seeing people as forensic psychiatrists, usually our role is going to be, well, in, in crime fiction and in, in criminal um, law with forensic psychiatry, we are usually seeing someone to do an evaluation, to write a report to the court, perhaps to testify in court about a specific issue uh, related to that person. So I'm doing an evaluation, for example, about someone's competency to stand trial, or their sanity at the time of the act, or their future risk of, of violence. In doing that evaluation, I'm getting a lot of history about their life, not just about the time of the crime. So I'm asking many questions about their life story. I'm asking many questions about their substance use history, about their psychiatric history, and, and then focusing in on what they're alleged to have done or, or what they've been found guilty of doing. One of the things that we consider is malingering or feigning of mental illness. Is someone uh, making up a mental illness out of whole cloth? Are they exaggerating a mental illness that they or a family member has had? Some people minimize their mental illness background because they don't want to be uh, perceived negatively by society. So we're determining uh, or attempting to determine if someone's malingering, if, if they're exaggerating, if, if they're completely feigning. And we use our um, knowledge of mental illness from having you know, treated many patients over years, as well as our studies, et cetera, of what real mental illness looks like. And then we look at the behaviors of, of the person at the time. We look at many collateral records of what do the police reports say, what do hospital reports say, not just what the person sitting in front of us says. Also, it's often the province of forensic psychologists, our colleagues, who will do testing for malingering as well. And so we use all of that information to make our best report about the person's mental illness or, or lack thereof, their feigning or lack thereof, and really use all of those pieces of the puzzle. And so sometimes someone can be very convincing in person. And uh, the most convincing people, if they're telling a tall tale about a crime or uh, trying to make it appear that they were mentally unwell at the time when they weren't, the people who are most convincing are the people who, who know the most about mental illness, right? So maybe they have themselves experienced mental illness or their family members have, and they've been uh, thinking a, a long time about how to make it sound like they were mentally unwell. In some of those cases, it can be really difficult, but then sometimes you get the, the police reports and the witness statements and the hospital reports uh, and their 
may be very different from what the person uh, tells you. Whereas you may have been really drawn in as a human being to the story that they've told you, the um, more objective evidence uh, says differently. And it, it's never a, a, a snap judgment about someone um, lying or someone lingering. It's really looking at all of these different pieces of evidence uh, to make those determinations. Just a quick break from the interview. Are you getting value from the podcast? Please consider supporting it and all the work I do at the Indie Author by becoming a patron. To pledge a monthly contribution, go to patreon.com forward slash the Indie Author, or to make an occasional contribution, perhaps to indicate the value that a specific episode or resource provided to you on your creative voyage, scroll to the bottom of any page at theindieauthor.com and click buy me a coffee. And now back to the interview. We had touched on the next topic that I wanted to cover a little bit already, but it's the idea that competency to stand trial and sanity at the time of the act are two different concepts. Anything you'd like to add to that? Sure. I'm keen to explain both of them because, yeah, I see them um, mixed up in fiction and real life. Competency, which uh, depending on the location might also be um, referred to as fitness to stand trial. This is in the here and now, someone's mental state versus sanity is something at the time of the act. So competency or fitness to stand trial, an idea that uh, we wouldn't want to, as a uh, society, try someone who's unable to uh, help themselves in court for uh, whatever uh, usually mental health related reason. So if someone um, has a severe intellectual disability and they don't un understand what's going on in court, we would, in, in general, think they're unable to uh, participate at present. They're, they're not competent. If someone is unable to help their lawyer to provide information to their lawyer about the offending or uh, about the situation or is unable to pay attention to what's going on in court. For example, maybe they have a, a delusion, a fixed false belief about someone in the courtroom. They, they believe the judge is related to them and, and will always release them or any other delusion like that, then it's possible that the person would be incompetent to stand trial. And then that's not the final answer. Then what we want to do is try and restore them to competency to stand trial. And I'm speaking in generalities here because there's different laws with everything. But in general, then that person would be forensically hospitalized in a forensic hospital. They're often also referred to as, as state forensic hospitals. And our goal would be to restore them to competency. So they in general would uh, be treated with medication uh, to help treat whatever disorder they had, if it was something you could treat with medication. And uh, teaching and, and, and groups learning about the court process so that then hopefully they could be restored to competency to stand trial. It's a here and now thing, depending on the person's mental illness, it can certainly change over time. That's different than sanity at the time of the act. And the bulk of the states have sanity laws. Uh, they're slightly different in different states, but in general, sanity is about at the time of the act, um, the person's mental illness. And did they understand what they were doing, et cetera, at the time? And so you can then imagine that there are many times where you're seeing someone right now for an evaluation, they're not uh, competent. They may well have been sane when they did the crime, but right now they're not able to assist in their defense or able to understand what's going on in court. But the opposite can also be true. The, the person was insane at the time or has uh, qualities that would suggest that, but right now they're getting treated and they understand and they're able to go to trial. So they're different concepts. And if say someone goes to trial, they're found uh, insane, then in general, the next thing is they would be hospitalized for treatment rather than punishment, because the idea behind an insanity is that really if someone was so mentally unwell at the time, what are we doing punishing them? Shouldn't we be treating them? Someone is trying to make some decisions about their plot. And I'm assuming that in general, it is the defense attorney who is more likely to be arguing that their client is either not competent to stand trial or was not sane at the time of the act. Is there one of those that's easier or harder to disprove? If the lawyer is trying to make that plug about competency or sanity, they have a better chance arguing one or the other? 
they should get an objective evaluation um, mm-hmm. for, for either one. Competency is more something that's changeable, right? Because it's a here and now thing versus sanity was at, at the time of the act. And a, a finding of, of insanity is uh, pretty rare, despite what we might uh, believe from media and trials that are in the media. But so competency is a here and now. It's in general not a permanent disposition, whereas the insanity would be the end um, outcome of some court cases. As far as the evaluations, uh, there may be a psychiatrist who works for the court, who is court appointed, but the defense and prosecution can also have a forensic psychiatrist that, that they ask to evaluate the client. And you're right that in general, it's, it's the defense attorney who's going to bring up the concerns because it's the defense attorney who's talking to the defendant, trying to understand their side of the story, for example, and then the things their client is, is saying just aren't making sense to the defense attorney, et cetera. And so oftentimes that's why we would get a referral for a competency evaluation. But anyone in the process, whether it's the judge or the prosecutor or the defense attorney who has a concern about competency could be bringing it up. There was one more that I wanted to hit in the time we have available to us, and that is forensic psychiatrists don't pat our evaluees on the shoulder or give them hugs when they are sad or talking about their trauma or offending, which I've got to believe is maybe one of the most gotten wrong parts of this in crime fiction. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So psychiatrists in general, we want good things for our patients, for example, or we want good things in in the interest of justice for our forensic evaluees, but we're not there to comfort them physically. There would be very rarely any circumstance where a psychiatrist would be engaging in physical contact other than a handshake with a um, patient or a forensic psychiatrist with an evaluee. And and yes, uh, so, so often I'm in a good book and I'm reading it and then all of a sudden there's a hug or a pat. And certainly like I'm human, you hear a sad story. It's a human thing to, to think about wanting to pat someone on the shoulder or something like that, but that's a, a line we, we wouldn't cross in general. There, there are other movies where psychiatrists end up in romantic relationships with their patients. And those are, yeah, completely across any line that psychiatrists should be. So I would think that in the sense that a movie or a book about a completely standard psychiatric interaction might leave something to be desired. I can imagine that's a legitimate choice as long as the writer is clear that a line has been crossed and that this is a problem. It's not just, oh, and by the way, they had this kind of professional relationship before they had the personal relationship. Do you agree with that? So I I think that as a reader who is a psychiatrist and a forensic psychiatrist, when a line needs to be crossed in fiction, I would love to see at least the person reflecting on this like ethically and and what would that's not what I would normally do in that situation or that's not the normal ethical line at least that would tell the reader oh there's something going on here that's different than it should be yeah I think that would need to be a whole like that's maybe the plot (laughs) you know (laughs) where you're exploring what that means and then I think that there's the extreme example where they become romantically involved but then there's just lots and lots of hugging going on I think in fiction platonic hugging going on, comforting hugging going on, which uh, I think people should be aware that it's not intrinsic to the plot and it is going to be taking eligible people out of the story. So we only hit half of the 10 myths corrected that are covered in the uh, article you wrote, Forensic Psychiatrist and Crime Fiction, 10 uh, Myths Corrected by Susan Hatters Friedman, MD. And I'm going to uh, include a link to that in the show notes. But Susan, this has been so interesting. Is there anywhere else you would like to send people either your own sites or resources or others to learn more about this? Absolutely. So uh, I, I do think talking to a forensic psychiatrist, if you have questions, could be a, a really helpful thing. And I've spoken to different authors about procedures in forensic hospitals, for example, or, or all sorts of other topics. The other thing is I would send people to our field's uh, journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law is uh, currently available free online to anyone. And it's at japl.org, so J-A-A-P-L.org. And uh, there's an advanced search and you can look up all sorts of forensic topics. You might find yourself reading for hours down a rabbit hole, but you know what? my career is such a wonderful field and so many interesting things. And I think for crime writers as well. 
Well, Susan, thank you so much for sharing some of those. It was great to talk to you. Great to talk to you too. Thank you.